Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussions, news, and interviews presenting the film scene with Ileana Douglas. Ileana is an actress, writer, author, and film historian with a need to discuss movies that borders on obsession. You'll learn the history of movies one great story at a time. The film scene is the deep cuts of movie podcasts featuring movies we love by the people who made them. And now, Ileana Douglas. Why, hello everyone. It's Ileana Douglas. Welcome to the film scene. I'm here with my co-host, Jeff Graham. Yes, eagerly anticipating this Sunday. It's L.A.'s Super Bowl. It is. Sunday the Oscars And they say up. we don't have seasons. <laughs> it is award season. Awards. It's always award season, though, now, right? That's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's been, it seems um, like it's, it's a, a longer and longer award season. A lot of award shows. I help with our red carpet coverage here at the network, so I'm yes. relieved that after this Sunday I can finally breathe again. A lot of guilds. There's a lot of guilds here in Los Angeles. I know, are. I know. Yes. Uh, but now we're up to the big one. It's the Academy. The Oscars. The Oscars. Yes. And uh, I feel very part of it this year since I hosted the uh, part of the luncheon. So cool. And that was, so I, I felt invested. And so not only did I see all of the films that were nominated, but I saw all of the, I saw every, I think this is the first year I've seen every single uh, short film, short documentary, um, animated film. In fact, at the luncheon, uh, I would go up to people and, you know, talk about their film. <laughs> people, you saw my film? Great. I said, yes, I mean, I that's my job. I, I take it very seriously. You're I one of the to... 10 people that saw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. That's You know what? I It would be really interesting to see how many Academy voters actually watch what they're voting on. And I've heard some, you know, I follow a ton of awards blogs. I'm like such a nerd for the race. Yes. And people are talking about potentially having you need to prove that you've seen it before you're allowed to vote. I don't know how they would do that, but I don't know either. Uh, that like, how would they implant a chip? A in little your... quiz. Well, I guess on the you know because some of the films I know you know if you're watching them on your computer or your television, I guess they would there'd be a watermark. Yeah. And that your IP address. If Netflix can track if we're watching it, I'm sure the yeah. Academy could figure out whether or not we're actually watching them. I must say there was one documentary. I won't say which one it was. I did mention this before. I, I there was uh, there were they were hitting some animals, and I oh, could yeah. not. Uh, there are certain triggers for me, mm -hmm. and I I couldn't get beyond it. So I did not get through that film. Well, I, I found it a little bit too. Too tough. You you tried. That's that's all that counts, right? At least you. It tried. wasn't my fa It wasn't my Oscar pick anyway. I have my for for documentary. I have the ones that I'm. I have no inside knowledge of anything. Yes. But I think uh, for documentary, American Factory is my pick. I, it's an incredible film. I think that's front running right now. I think uh, the experts and the pundits say that it's most likely to win for documentary. So the big mystery for me, because mainly I'm interested in the pool mm -hmm. at Phil Rosenthal's house. <laughs> Because <laughs> I never win. Yeah. But this year I'm determined. I've seen every single film. Awesome. But um, best picture, I don't know. Is a, I'm I'm really torn as to whether it's going to be 1917 all the way. Th these aren't my personal picks. Right. These are the pundits' picks. I have my, uh, you know, my favorite movie of the year was Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Mm. Uh, for some, uh, for me, that's just my favorite. With Parasite being second. Yeah. And so for best picture, I don't. I don't know if it's going to be 1917 uh, all the way or if it's going to be maybe a mix up and have it be Parasite for Best Picture. Those are the two front runners right now. I think yeah. uh, Gold Derby, which is a awards blog I love following. Uh, yeah. It's like if ESPN covered awards shows, which is just like the best. Uh, they have 1917 like front running right now, but I think Parasite could sneak in there. Be the first year a non English language film wins picture. Yeah. Which would be pretty huge. And I think if any film deserves to do it, I think Parasite's a masterpiece. I know we overuse that word, but uh <laughs> yes. I loved that movie. I did too. I yeah. thought it was uh, an incredible film. I'm looking forward to they're gonna do an American version of it. I know. It's interesting. My my knee jerk was to be wary of that, um, yeah. but Adam McKay's production company is behind it, mm -hmm. and um, consistently I've loved everything he's done. Especially yeah. like I like his comedies, but he's gotten kind of serious this decade. You know, with mm -hmm. the Big Short and then Vice and Succession. I don't know if I know yeah. you're still figuring that show out a little bit, which a lot of I people am. are. But very dark. It's very dark. But season two, I think, really elevated that show. So I trust Adam McKay, and I think the material of Parasite 
could lend well to his kind of sensibilities. So. Yes. And HBO. HBO is consistently good TV. I'm so. always look, yeah, I'm always looking forward to it. What about the best? It seems like Brad Pitt is a lock. I think most of the acting noms feel very much like locks this year. Yeah. I think I'm hearing Joaquin for actor, yeah. Renee for actress. Yes. Laura Dern for supporting, which for supporting. who doesn't like Laura Dern? And then Brad Pitt finally getting his Oscar, right? Yeah. I think everybody in the world is rooting for him. Yeah. He's yeah. great in the movie. Yeah, and he's, over the years, consistently put done so many great films. It's interesting. Brad Pitt's won Oscars for producing. Because, uh-huh. you know, he produced 12 Years a Slave, which is really interesting. Oh, yes, So right. um, this would be his first performance Oscar, but I technically think it would. it's not his first actual Academy Award. No, it, it's, uh, it's interesting, too, with somebody uh, also, you know, like Laura Dern, where it almost, again, becomes a career. Right. You know, I thought she was terrific in the... In the film, mm-hmm. um, Marriage Story, but uh, it, it be, does it become almost representational of the film? Interesting. You mean like Marriage Story winning for actress? Yeah, best supporting. Then, she, then it, it, it's like we we then represent that film and everybody who was in it with the one performance. It, it feels as if that's lately what the awards seem to represent that's interesting i think you kind of don't know until time passes you know it's like a decade later i think is really when you can start to look at movies and decide how they sit culturally you know yes because you know the favorite which was a fun movie last year olivia coleman won right and i do think if you're going to give that movie an award giving it to olivia coleman makes sense she's unbelievable Mm -hmm. in that film yeah i i voted for her Mm -hmm. last year when yeah when i had the opportunity to vote for her um and the film um, Judy, mm-hmm. I was, I guess I've been slightly surprised that Scarlett Johansson has not won more uh, just for the dual performance of being in Marriage Story and then also Jojo Rabbit. It's really great in both. Yeah. I personally think uh, Scarlett Johansson's performance in Marriage Story, that's the performance of the year for me. Personally, that would be my vote. Yeah, um, but I do think Renee's a lock for that. And she's also wonderful in Judy. She is. She's incredible. Yeah. But you know, again, it's it it takes some of the suspense away mm-hmm. if uh, that Scarlett Johansson is because I agree with you. I, I going into it, I thought, oh, she's a lock. Yeah, and then it just didn't. It, it because traditionally, I was thinking of well, the year that Jessica Lange was nominated for both Tootsie and Francis Farmer. Oh, yeah. And then she won for Tootsie, uh-huh. but she really sort of won for Francis Farmer. <laughs> That's what's interesting with Laura Dern is I would argue, and she's better in Little Women than she is in Marriage Story. So, and I know. I guess, again, it's the idea the dual, you yeah. know, our, our in house guest is nodding. I'm not going to. I know. I can't wait to hear his thoughts. We have Dennis Christopher sitting with us. Oh, I know. Anna. We're very excited to have yes. Dennis here. Well, uh, last, before we go, any other things that you are looking forward to? Best costumes? I was a little disappointed. Uh, Dolomite received nothing this year, no costumes. I really wanted Eddie Murphy to get a nomination. There's some shutouts this year. Ryan and I actually, check it out on this channel, did uh, four takeaways from the Oscar right when the nominations dropped. Yeah. The big one for me, I thought Jordan Peele's movie Us was incredible. Right. I was great very film. surprised. Completely, to me, like, yeah. give that a screenplay nomination. Yeah. I thought Lupita was incredible in that movie. I mean, it's, there's more and more movies every year. Here's a suggestion that I thought of this year is that rather than, you know, they for the films, they offer 10 films mm-hmm. for best picture but why not do the same for screenwriting totally agree i think the idea would be because there's an adapted and an original category uh-huh. but even still there's so many movies now and i think especially right. with director they mm-hmm. should open up that category because you think about it with performances there are really 20 slots if you break it down between supporting and main mm-hmm. and then with screenplay I could see them opening up, but there technically are 10 open screenplay slots. There's really still just those five director slots. I feel that with screenplay, you know, maybe because I'm a writer myself, Mm -hmm. screenplay is so... There's no movie without a screenplay. I totally agree. Is it maybe, again, there needs to be... Uh, you know, there's original screenplay, there's adapted screenplay, and maybe there needs to be one more category of screenplay, and I don't know what that is. Maybe you call it the Dalton... Trumbo Award or, you know, something so that we could open it up. 
make it a little more diverse. I don't know. It would be interesting, yeah, screenplay where the protagonist isn't a male, like a white male. <laughs> I, cause, or even like, you know, I would love it if they did like, the movie costs less than a million dollars. Look, we're looking at the directors there. There they are. <laughs> Bong Joon-ho. This is Ryan. Uh, producer just chiming in. I'm yes. really yeah. curious to hear who Ileana thinks uh, will win Best Director. I, I really don't know. I think this one's a toss-up. It's a toss-up this year for director. I think so, too. Again, I have my, you know, my personal favorites, so I'm not going to mention who it is uh, in terms of, I I mean, all along the way, it looks like Sam Mendes. I know. So that's who I'll be playing in my uh, lottery. I'm going to put Bong for director. I think he's going to take it. Really? Yeah, well, the Academy's gone very international for directors in the last decade. Okay, you mean he could go, it could be like last year, where... 17 will get picture, and then Bong will get director, is what I'm predicting. I agree with you, or it could go the other way. The other way, but I think there'll be a split. I think it'll be a picture-director split, however they go. Interesting. The Academy's gone very international for director. The only American winner in the last decade was Damien Chazelle for... Yeah. uh, Because, you know, the, the Three Amigos... Quaron, Inaritu, and um, who am I? Forget? Del Toro. Right. They've been just passing that award around. Inaritu's won it twice. Quaron's won it twice. Yeah. Hardly any Americans win director anymore. I must say, regardless of what happens or controversy that women weren't nominated, uh, I would say that the the these directors, the the variety of films this year, uh, I found incredibly appealing. Yeah. And all really, really great films in uh, in different ways. Yeah, you know, even The Irishman, which I particularly, I just for me, it felt a little long. Um. <laughs> for you and for many people, <laughs> I don't think you're alone in that one. <laughs> I had to say the sentence. I've only seen the first two and a half hours of that film, and I was like, that's not a sentence people should have to say. That's funny. Yeah, I felt bad that Robert De Niro did not snag I know. a nomination because it is a great film. It's just a little. <laughs> yeah, and I li- and I'm going to revisit it. Yeah, and there's very few films that I don't see a second time. Yeah, unless it's so disturbing, you know, that I I, I can't. Yeah, or that one movie that I, I just couldn't. Right, it was a documentary. It was like, oh man, the world is things are. Dark. Not great in the world, but yes. I'm looking forward to it. What about? Do you, are you interested at all in what people wear? Is that eh, at all? That's not that's totally fun. my bag. It's fun, it's fun when people like the surprise. Like there's I no think... more shares showing up. Exactly. Like First time nominees are always fun. Like the like the yeah. young doe eyed. I'm trying to think. It's a big veteran year. I feel like there's yeah. no kind of newcomers like. Lady Gaga style newcomers this year, you know. No, um, Elton John. Elton John will probably win. be there. He may win. Um, oh yeah, for music, for song. What about right? animated picture? That's a toss up for me. I know what I voted for is different than what I feel may win. I'm hearing actually Klaus, which I didn't see. Yeah. Um, is front runner. I heard it's wonderful. I heard that's a beautiful, excellent film. film. Yeah. As is the short. Uh, some of the shorts this year, my favorite being Kit Bull. Great. Uh, very, very. There's some really interesting. If you get a chance, I mean, it's one of the great things about being in L.A. at the Arrow or at the American Cinematheque. You can, you can see a lot of these nominated short films, totally. and they're they're terrific. You know, they're they're great films in their in their own right. And some of the short documentary subjects, St. Louis Superman, excellent. Walk, Run, Cha Cha. I saw every film. That's great. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> I love it. All right. I want to get Dennis in here to talk about some of his Oscar stuff. Let me give you some of his credits. Of course, we all know him from uh, Breaking Away. My, again, one of my drive-in favorites, Fade to Black, Chariots of Fire, and uh, more recently, Django Unchained and Deadwood. He's been in nearly 40 movies since 1975. Won a BAFTA for Best Promising Newcomer. And uh, recently, my God, look at all these TV credits. Law and Order, I Deadwood, I mentioned uh, Star Trek. What other things? Met everyone under the sun. And uh, <laughs> we've met each other here and there over the years. Yes, Welcome, we everyone. Dennis I'm, Christopher. I'm really glad to be here. I'm yeah. thrilled to, to, to see you. Um, now, I want to start. We were talking about the, uh, the Oscars, and you actually did. You you got to go to the Oscars, which yeah, is the great. Yeah, the Breaking Away was nominated for Best Picture. Um, I got to go. That was, was amazing. Yeah. That must have been amazing. It and was amazing. Who was your date? 
Marisa Berenson. I mean, <laughs> come on, that's not bad. <laughs> no, it wasn't. She, she's she's a good friend. Oh, wonderful. Um, so I want to go back to the beginning. You were you grew up in Philly. And you're half Italian. South Philadelphia. South Philly. South Philly. Half Italian, yeah. half Irish. Yeah. And did you go to the movies? Do you remember the first movie you saw? Who took oh, you to see God. it? I, you know, I was trying to conjure that the other night. I do know that my sister snuck me into Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. <laughs> Wow. That's quite a first film. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, it wasn't my first film. Okay. But I was clearly underage. Yeah. And I I think I was under her coat in the wintertime. That's how cold it can be in Philly. Yeah. Uh, and she snuck me in to see this movie because she knew how much movies meant to me. And we shared that. And um, plus the b fact that we knew it was going to be great. And uh, she was a fan of Elizabeth Taylor. Mm -hmm. And I already was a fan of Edward Albee. Amazing. And we're going to get to, I mean, it's very early on, but how surreal that then many years later you would work with Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, yeah, yeah. I feel like we've had, has serendipity, serendipity played a, a, a large part in your career? Yeah, there's a real, um, I've been thinking about it lately. Let me move this cup so as not to muddy my yes. lines. <laughs> <laughs> I've been thinking, it, I've had a very Zelig-like career because it's been over this period of time between, I mean, we were talking earlier, I've worked with Lillian Gish. Right. I've worked with Elizabeth Taylor. I've, I mean, there's so many people from the old school that yes. I've worked with, and now people from the new school, my last film being a Tarantino picture. Right. Um, so I've been in all of these places, you know, at all the times, and mm -hmm. the patchwork of people that I've met, the styles that I've seen, I've been able to fit into all of the kind of movies. So it was more, it was serendipitous. It, it, it really was. Mm -hmm. Going back to the, um, and some, it, you, I was reading you wanted to be an actor and a hippie, so you just flew to Europe, and that's how you Well, the first thing I wanted to be is I wanted to be a priest. <laughs> because to me, that was real theater. Uh -huh. And uh, everyone was looking at you. There's incense going. The costumes right. <laughs> were fantastic. There was a hell of a lot of myth going on. Yeah. And oh, there's me and Lillian. Um, Amazing. I, I wrote an article that was never published uh, for Interview Magazine called Dead in Bed with Lillian Gish. Because <laughs> that's us from a picture called A Wedding. Uh -huh. where she, the Robert Altman yeah, movie. Yeah, she has yeah. one scene and then she passes away and then right. everybody has a scene with her as while she's dead. Yes. But before that, I went in and did an interview with her called Dead in Bed with Lillian Gish. And everybody that she was gossiping about, the people in Interview Magazine weren't quite sure that people would know who they were because she was talking about Scott and Zelda and <laughs> Tallulah and people like that Scott Fitzgerald and Scotty wow. Fitzgerald and wow. yeah. Zelda and Tallulah Bankhead and she said Tallulah Bankhead was a fraud the real one was Zelda Bankhead copied everything that Zelda did Zelda was really the creative one and Bankhead was just a carbon copy of her that's yeah. from Lillian Gish's mouth yeah you know, doesn't get better than she that she was friends with both of them Wow. but um, it's been that kind of thing from her to I guess Well, you had a. You also mentioned the connection you had with Cary Grant. Oh yeah, I am. Um, Another crazy. We came to California after my mother died in a Greyhound bus, me and my father, to cheer ourselves up, because my eldest brother Vince was living in California, and he happened to be friends with Cary Grant, and um, we're staying at the El Portal uh, Motel, not too far from this studio here on Ventura Boulevard, and uh, my father's out with my brother. The hotel telephone rings, and it's Cary Grant on the phone. And he says, hello, Dennis. <laughs> I, I'm not going to do the thing. I'm not going to do an impersonation of him. <laughs> and he asked me to come and babysit. He said, I'm a friend of your brother's Vince, and I hear they quite a babysitter. I want to pay. And he sent a car for me to the El Portal, picked me up, drove me to Malibu, where him and Diane Cannon lived. Uh -huh. And I babysat for Jennifer? Jennifer, yes. Who I have met since then <laughs> as an adult <laughs> and paid me quite well. And the car picked me up and brought me back to the El Portal in the Valley. So. Wow. But I met him and he was a great guy and I was gobsmacked the whole time. I don't think I said one word to him because I was just... Because um, the movies were always my way out. Mm -hmm. 
movies were something that I latched onto very early. You asked me what's the first movie I saw. I think I think I have I can tell you the movie that made me want to be an actor, but I think I saw Mighty Joe Young mm -hmm. when I was a fetus. <laughs> <laughs> now, th th yeah, maybe on and television. And it must have been, no, it, really? it was in a theater, theater, but I think it was in a revival house. Uh -huh. And I couldn't believe it. Yeah. I was, no, but I was really young. I was like yeah. two or something like that. And I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Um, and then the movie that I wanted to become an actor for was called The Robe. Hmm. Yes. Paul and Newman. No, Richard Burton. Oh, Richard Burton. And Gene Simmons. How I, oh, I'm thinking of The Silver Chalice. No, uh, yeah. And Pardon me. There was an actor in this movie called Jay Robinson. In Philly, mm -hmm. at every religious holiday, there'd be a religious movie right. on the movies that they would show on TV, and we'd be plunked down in front of the TV, and we would all, as a family, watch these religious <laughs> movies every year to yes. kind of drill it into us after we just left the church. Right. You know, we're still are watching you know, <laughs> another crucifixion or another birth in a manger <laughs> or another whatever it was. Yes. And I remember seeing The Robe, and I was so young, it's when I thought movies were real things. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was somehow I was seeing something that was real. Yes. On this, I was that young, that impressionable. And when this guy Jay Robinson came out, who was playing Caligula, mm -hmm. I was really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> it was the most evil thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I didn't even know what evil was. I mean, I was soon to find out because they were going to cut off... Richard Burton and Gene Simmons' heads yeah. in a few minutes. <laughs> so I really found out how far it could go, this evil. Yeah. Um, and I wanted it. I wanted in. And, I, and when I found out, my sister explained to me that it wasn't real, that these people were pretending mm -hmm. to be people in history. I thought, oh, come on. I got to be in that. <laughs> <laughs> and I did suddenly, it was forget the priesthood. And, you know, it was puberty, sex was coming on and stuff. And, you know, when I found out the real bargain that you had to make, right. um, I decided to choose the theater. The theater. <laughs> yes. Um, so we were saying before, so somehow you end up in Europe and then you Oh, meet, no, that was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you end up in Europe, which is, again, it takes a lot of courage. Just well, I wanted No to, cell phones or I, anything. I, I wanted to be a hippie. I was in yeah. California. I went there with no, absolutely no money, no connections. Um, I stayed at a hotel on Hollywood Boulevard, a broken down one that's been torn down millions of years ago. Mm -hmm. The USO was in the basement of this hotel, like way east of Bronson uh -huh. on Hollywood Boulevard. So um, I was broke in Hollywood. I worked for about two years as a bag boy in Gelson's. And I was enamored of this uh, young lady at the time. And she was in Europe and she was going back on what they used to call bucket flights. Mm -hmm where you could buy a one-way ticket for very little money, like $90 or mm -hmm. something like this, and a really crappy old plane. It was charter flights, they called them. Right. And um, she, was, she had made arrangements to go and was leaving me, and I th made the grand gesture when I got my tax refund back. <laughs> and I bought a ticket, unbeknownst to her, and was on the flight. No return trip ticket. I had $17, $18, again, in my pocket. Uh -huh. When I got there, she had to pass money through. There was a chain link fence before customs to give me all her money. Because uh -huh. you know how they ask you how much money you have? Right. Especially when you don't have a round trip ticket. Yeah. Um, and that's how I got in. And I stayed for, I don't know, I guess a couple of years. And in the back of my mind, I always thought the only person that's going to understand me or give me a job would be Fellini. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Indeed, my first night in Rome, I met Fellini. Wow. That's crazy. On first the, night? On the streets, yeah. I, we were hitchhiking, and these people drove right into Rome. Um, there's a whole story there. One of them became a famous photographer later, a New York photographer. But um, we drove into Rome. We, went to, we got there pretty late at night. There was a, we, I had a... A duffel bag. Jeannie was the girl that I was accompanying with, my good friend at the time, and these two strangers. And we were eating at a place, a bowl of pasta on the street, the cheapest place we could find. And I see this woman walk past me, and it was Verushka. 
And this is a model from the 70s mm -hmm. who was so unbelievably beautiful. And the way she was photographed by Avedon and Bert Stern, it was, they were just magnificent. It's, uh, magazines actually were my first entrance into imagination. Mm -hmm. um, that's how I got there. It was through photographs and still images. And I saw this woman, and she's in a calved hand. She's barefoot. She's walking through the streets of Rome after midnight. And they're all talking shit my friends and I waited too long but I thought I've got to I've got to go and I jumped up and I went in the direction of where she was and I promptly got lost because all the streets in Rome were like little cul-de-sacs mm -hmm. and little tiny streets that lead nowhere and you could lose a person in a second and she she wasn't trying to lose me but she did lose me I turned the corner I come upon a street where they're shooting all this stuff and I and it looked very cheap to me Mm -hmm. and tacky is what I thought. And I'm a hippie kid with hair down to you know, past my shoulders and bell bottoms with patches all over them and a big duffel bag. And I, I'm watching it, and there's ropes there. I make my way to the front of the ropes, and there's you know, Italian guards all around holding the ropes. And I'm watching this film or whatever is being done on the street. It looked like a festival, a street festival. And... Jeannie finally catches up to me. I guess I'm watching for an hour or two, and she's pissed off. She's dragging my duffel bag, and she's saying, well, there's your big guy over there. There's your, there's your dream come true. What the hell are you going to do now? Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean? She said, the guy on top of that crane is Fellini. <laughs> she said, what are you going to do now? And Because she, she was angry with me. And I said, okay. And I asked her, if she would talk to that guard for me. And she said, why? I said, just go and talk to him. So she went over and talk, talked to him, and I ducked under the rope and walked in a straight line from where I was to where Fellini was, right into a scene that was being shot. And he screamed, corta, corta, and everything stopped. I mm. walked right into the middle of the scene. And I'm trembling. I mean, I know what I'm doing. I'd been in a couple of movies before in California, but I'm, like, shaking like a leaf. But I thought, I'm never going to meet him through agents or <laughs> casting people. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm practically homeless here in Italy. What, <laughs> you know, And um, they took me away, and they put me in an alley that was a cul-de-sac. And I'm standing there kind of shaking. And, like, half a block away the entrance where they were shooting, all the lights pouring in from the movie. And what comes and blocks the entrance to this little street is that figure with the cape and the hat that you've seen in pictures. Right. And he walks down. When he gets within range of being able to see me, he clearly knows that I'm American. So he says, or English, and he says, what was so important that you had to ruin my movie? So now I, I couldn't talk. I was like, oh. I couldn't say anything. I mean, you know, being yelled at by Fellini, who was the person that I thought was going to give me my birth as an actor, right. was going to finally see what I was worth and use me for something. And I said, Mr. Fellini, oh, I'm sorry. I just had a dream about you. <laughs> he said, a dream. And I said, yeah. He said, what was your dream? And I said a couple of words to him. I said, clowns and stones, and there were <laughs> colors coming in, and there was a beach full of these big rocks, and you were there, and there were these clowns. And he listened to me, and it really was a dream that I had. And he said, are you, then he said, he looked at me really hard, and he said, are you an actor? And I knew it was all about that question. Mm. And I said, I was gaining my composure back a little bit. And I was young. I was like... Right. 18 or 17 because yeah. I got emancipated when I was 17 um, and he uh, I said no and he stopped and he said you be here tomorrow night they will call you stay here and that's it. And I worked for him for three weeks after that. They had a section around his chair mm -hmm. that was for the, that no one could go in. It mm -hmm. was roped off, and his chair was in the middle. And all in that section was what they would call his dream people. Mm -hmm. And they were, there would be like the 400 pound lady. <laughs> there would be, you know, the guy with yeah. eyes bulging out of his head. There'd be me. There were all <laughs> these kind of characters that were floating around in his head. Right. And, um, 
And that's where I worked for the next three weeks, being placed into scenes. And the one scene that you can really see me in the movie is mm-hmm. right before Gore Vidal's scene. I'm sitting in front of a raging fire, mm-hmm. and I'm telling <laughs> these two girls, hippie girls, about my dream. And it pans from me all the way down to Gore, and Gore gets to do his scene. So it was quite a, a That is great. And what's the film? It's called Fellini's Roma. Oh, that one, Fellini's Roma. Okay, so we can, so everybody. And then I went on to do another one called Salome, mm-hmm. and then ended up in Italian jail. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so. <laughs> With what? Pierre Clemente. Yeah. You remember him? Yes. He's the one that kept me out of trouble in prison because he, the first day that I was out in the, in the yard where you walk around in the circle. Yeah. Um, it was crazy. Um, it was crazy. The wolves were there. And he claimed me as his own. And if you knew who Peter Clemente was, he was a really big film star in Italy and a very handsome man. And he took a drug rap for his fiance. And at the time, they were jailing drug people for life. And he was in jail. And he had been in jail for many years. And he had the cachet of being Pierre Clemente. Yeah. And um, they listened to him in jail, and he claimed me as his own, just flung his arm around my shoulder, and I thought, well, this ain't bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. How could, long were you in Italian worked. jail? About 12, 13 days. Wow. With Pierre Clemente. Not in the same cell. It was just when I was put <laughs> into public places, people okay. knew to stay off, to lay off, because... I look like a snack, you know, let's right. face it. <laughs> and there was a lot of hungry people in that jail. It's, wow. it's the jail in the center of Rome. So it's mm. really funky. I'm and, sure. And really ancient. The prison was ancient. So, um, yeah, it was a really hard time for me. Um, but Fellini, when he found out I was jail, he made a public statement, and I finally got cleared. But when I got out, they said, you've worked too uh, movies here and your passport was stamped for two weeks or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so would you mind going? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I, I, I did. Uh, wow. Did you ever see Fellini again? No, I wish Isn't I that's so had. interesting though. Yeah. But that's he, an actor. He used to do this thing with me. He used to talk to me in Italian. And I knew a little bit of it because of being raised in an Italian household. Right. And he used to talk to me very affectionately. Like, you know, bambini and, and, yeah. and stuff like that. And as I was saying, I had long, long, white, blonde hair. And right. I looked like I was 12. Right. And in a funny sort of way, I looked a bit like Julia. Interesting. Juliette Messina. Yeah. And she would come every morning in the car in the limousine. And the thing would go down, the window would go down, and you'd just see her eyes. And she would sit there silently. And they knew what to do because that would, when the sun was coming up, we only shot at night. He would get in the car with her, and they would take off. He would nap. He would, she would make breakfast for him. Mm-hmm. He would nap, and he would edit the film and then come to work. Wow. And his films were an assemblage of his, dream, of his dreams. That's why when I said the word dream, he decided right. to, you know, put me in the basket. <laughs> you know what I mean? Kind of <laughs> but what he would do is he would take me, and he would set me in the middle of a square. And then he would stand and look at the square. And he worked. It would take hours for him to set a shot. Wow. And he would put the people in one at a time, the extras. He'd put political posters up there. He'd have them put posters up there. He'd have them paint graffiti on this wall. They'd put trash in this thing. They'd put this. Mm -hmm. This one at a time, like he was painting, you know, like he was making a collage, a living collage. And I would be in this one particular spot. And then when it was done, he'd say, Vienna, Deniki. And I'd co- go with him, and he'd put his arms around me, and he'd let me look through the camera. At, and I, what I was standing, I was keeping the focal point for him behind the camera. He needed a marker, mm-hmm. and he used me as the marker. And then when the scene would go, he'd put Peter right. Gonzalez or one of the actors, and it was playing a, a scene in that square. And he would put his arm over my shoulder, and we'd watch it together. Very, very fatherly. Yes. Very fatherly. And... and it really meant a lot to me. It was like the Italian father I didn't have. Yeah. That I always wanted, that I had dreamed about. I know, and you made it happen. <sighs> I mean, that's... I, I think o- life made it happen, and I was just super present. Hmm. Well, sometimes I think that you have uh, that one... I mean, that's what I wrote about in my book, this ability to manifest thing because you mm. just believe in it so much, you know, that... Mm-hmm. 
you're going to meet Fellini and then you meet Fellini. And it's somehow, this is what I always find interesting is what was it he saw in you? And then again, it's a kind of a love, I think. It's a reciprocal, they see something in you that is a vibration of, of love. That's what I always sort of think. I think that's a real good you know, way to look at it. There's a purity. There was a purity about my wanting to be an actor. Yeah. There really was. I, I'm, I'm not, it was a big ass calling for me. Mm -hmm. It was everything to me. And, you know, I did all the stuff that you did during the period of time that you're alive. You know, the protesting, the drug taking, the hanging <laughs> out, the uh, promiscuity. Thank God it was pre-AIDS. You know, all of that stuff. Um, I went through all of it. And I, <laughs> and I would go full out. But there was always something in the back of my head that would say, don't go that far. The phone might ring tomorrow. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the phone usually did ring on your worst, most hungover day. You know, we're, we're faxing over the pages now. Oh, that's Can right. you be oh, there at 4 o'clock? You know what I mean? <laughs> okay, so, you, so then you go, go back to New York, and then again you have another strange, I, I, it's sort of, you Detour? know. Detour? Yeah, tell you know where you end up working with um, Halston. Well, Tony Perkins and his wife Barry Berenson were very good friends of mine, and um, when I came back from Europe, uh, <laughs> penniless, um, Barry was living with Tony, so she said, "You go and stay in my apartment," mm -hmm. which I did, and soon I met Halston. Just. Um, Tony and Barry's house was an oasis for a lot of artists from all different genres and all different ages and from all different careers. And it was a relaxed, really free atmosphere where people weren't pretending, they weren't being the stars that they were. You know, you never wore shoes. It was that kind of a thing. You'd stand mm. at the piano and sing songs with Sondheim. Wow. And it would be just the way that it went. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It was super relaxed. It takes you a minute to get used to it when you're as young as I was, but I did right. get used to it. And I met Halston in that situation. Well, hi, what do you do? I make ladies' dresses. What do you do? I'm an actor. It was that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Pass the joint. So <laughs> it was like that. And, you know, I was looking in New York. I was uh, looking to be a busboy, anything that I could get. I wasn't mm -hmm. trained. I only went to college for a minute and a half, and, you know, I paid for that. And when I got my grades, I went, this isn't going to help me be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck this. I'm going to go ahead and start getting rejected right now. Yeah. I hear it takes about five years of solid rejection. Yeah. So let me start. <laughs> um, and I don't know. I, 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 I worked at a place called Adam's, Adam, Adam's Apple and it was a place where all the waitresses were dressed as Eve and all the men were dressed as Adam and I had to wear a <laughs> loincloth and bus tables. Weird. It was really weird. It was on the Upper West Side, Adam's <laughs> Apple, or Adam and Eve. Uh, it was yeah, really it weird, up. a really weird bar. And it, uh, it was more than a bar. It was a big you know, singles place. And I couldn't, I didn't fit in. <laughs> and finally, um, Barry said, why don't you go over and put in an application at, at Halston? I said, I can't even sew a button on my thing. What are you talking about? So I went over, I filled out an application, I was desperate. I got a job in the stock room, mm -hmm. the lowest paying job it, there was. I was the only person in there of, uh, of the shade of color that I am <laughs> and of the age that I am. I don't know how to say that correctly. Um, anyway, uh, I worked there, and I was the only one that was actually working there. I had no idea that Halston was Halston. I thought he was just this tall guy mm -hmm. um, with a kind of regal attitude but fun you know and funny and like that you know and I could talk to him because it was a common area you know common friends and right um, so I worked there and I made some things happen there uh, good things like sweeping the floor of the stock room, <laughs> things like that. making things, picking things up because everybody was kind of posing and right. like I'm working at Alston, you know, as they pack the boxes. I'm thinking, what the, you know, pack the boxes, get the other one going, you know. I'm from Philly, let's get it going. So, um, 
he noticed, and he knew I was down there, and he asked me to come up one day, and he said, I need an assistant. I said, I, uh, 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 wow. I, uh, uh, I said, get somebody from FIT, please. I'm, it's not me. Get, get some poor soul that's going to be a designer. It's a great job. I, I need to stay down there. I'm going to be taking time off for auditions. I, I don't know anything about fashion. Look at me. He said, I know. I like the way you look. Hmm. And I said, he said, none of the kids from FIT, I've tried it before, are going to tell me the truth. He held up a picture. He said, what do you think of this, a sketch? Mm. He said, well, it looks like many things that you have done. And I think the older women will like it a lot. He said, that's it. I want you to come up here and work here. He said, nobody will tell me the truth. Right. Everybody will just say, fabulous. It's fa he said, you tell me what you see. Mm -hmm. And I would do it. And um, I started working there, and I became good friends with an artist who became a designer and then a, a fine artist, I believe, in his own right, Stephen Sprouse mm -hmm. and Bill Dugan. And the three of us, and we were all young. I, I was the youngest. Me and Sprouse were the youngest. Um, we worked in a, very, in a room this big with Halston, designing everything that women wanted to wear everywhere mm -hmm. and it was quite an insane feeling and quite a, quite an interesting world and quite a because he gave me a, a, a line of my own um he said here i'll, I'll give you five rain co uh, five coat patterns and i want you to do a rainwear line called halston three from these patterns from our you know regular mm -hmm. couture and regular lines and that's all I knew. So I had to find all the fabrics, all the stuff, all the things, match the fabrics with the paint, with the f patterns that we already <laughs> had cut and all that shit. And then you present it to him and you get your head chopped off a couple of times. Yeah. You go out and do it all over again, come back and you don't know what you're doing. You're just trying and trying and trying. Right. Until you learn the, the stuff that you can't explain. Yeah. You know, the, the stuff of whatever profession. And I learned it. And um, I made a really successful thing and that's the line that they sold to jc penny for like von millions of yeah. dollars later on and you know did you feel like you were playing uh, did i make any money no i made 87 dollars a week <laughs> after taxes <laughs> did you feel like you were playing a part another part in a movie because sometimes i there were certain jobs i, I had. got lost i got lost from like you're i got lost from it and he called me <laughs> this is why i loved him he called me in one day and he said when you go on these, uh, he said, how do you get these auditions? And I said, well, I'm trying to get an agent. I get, I showed him Backstage magazine. He looks through Backstage. And, like, getting a minute alone with him in the office is like, forget about it. You right. know what I mean? You can't, there's always things happening, and there's always a crisis, and you can't, yeah. you know. And, but he, he had a special moment for me, and I'm like, what? Well, um, where my head's not on the chopping block. So he looks through backstage he goes so what do you do and i said i send in pictures in my resume to these places and if they call me i go and audition for it he said do you wear the clothes that i make you wear to the audition and i said well i had to buy this sweater downstairs and i had to have these pants made and they were three hundred dollars and i don't have anything that costs three hundred dollars i said yeah i wear it. it's the only thing i have to wear and he said you can't wear these clothes to audition you're already playing a part here. He said, you have to go in neutral. Mm -hmm. And eventually, I really took it to heart because I cut off my hair, the hippie hair. Yeah. I stopped wearing my earth shoes or my platform shoes. I had, like, <laughs> the two choices, either earth shoes or platform <laughs> shoes, and got my sort of professional life together uh -huh. and polished myself a little bit as an adult. Right. Even though I still looked very young, which was always my advantage in, mm -hmm. in the business because they didn't need chaperones or teachers yeah. or any of that stuff. That's fascinating. So let uh, the so uh, that was that was that story. Um, and then I got Yentl, the Yeshiva boy, which turned into Yentl, went to Broadway, but I didn't go to Broadway with it. Although they asked me, I was I was making movies already in California. I know. Then you end up in California. I want to ask you just b briefly a, a movie that I. I remember seeing in high school, which I really loved, and, uh, James Bridges' film, oh. September 30th, 1955. Yeah. Um, uh, James Bridges, uh, just a wonderful director, died, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. very young. But yeah. uh, I worry to talk about your huge movies. But, man, I love that film. Oh, I loved it. Jimmy Mac. Yes. That's his name. And he was from Toad Suck, Toad Suck Ferry, Arkansas. <laughs> wow. And he... 
I really felt like I was discovered in that movie. It's a great because film it was if anybody ri- wants to. It was Richard check it out. Thomas yep. and Tom Hulse and Dennis Quaid. Mm-hmm. And Dennis Quaid and Tom Hulse and myself and Richard, to a certain extent, became lifelong friends. Yeah. And it's about James Dean. And it was so important to me. And it's the most personal movie that Bridges ever made because it's his story. Yeah. And when he got on that motorcycle, you know, when he came into California, you know where he went? He went yes. to Schwab's. Oh. And he sat with Martin Landau. He met Martin Landau on his first day. And, you know, Marty was good friends yes, with Dean. Yes, with James Dean. And they commiserated over the death of him. Yeah. And he became accepted into the circle. Jimmy Bridges. Jimmy yeah. Bridges. It was a great film. They, it, like, China get... Syndrome, this guy made. Paper Chase, this guy directed. And, you know, China Syndrome, he directed. Yeah. As well. He has, has wonderful made some director. great films, and he was a, a wonderful, wonderful guy. Yeah, it's kind of a tragedy. A great actor's director. and uh, But for anyone out there looking for an obscure film, I, that was one of my favorite movies I, I when it was on. Susan Terrell. Yeah, it's a it. great the, where we film became about friends early... And, that Hollywood. was a lifelong friendship, knowing Susan Terrell, and what an adventure. So, is it in? So, it must be around this era that. Uh, well, then you had the small part in, in a wedding, which you mentioned, and oh, then, with Shelley Duvall. Yeah, Shelley Duvall was a big influence on my life. My friendship with Shelley. She introduced me to Bob Altman. I, actually, she didn't introduce me. I went down to visit her on Three Women, mm-hmm. and Bob has that way of yeah taking you, and he took me, and. Um, I guess I made an impression because even though Shelley didn't do it, I came back for a wedding. Uh, well, on a wedding, another movie that I, met, I love. I interviewed Carol Burdett once, and all I wanted to <laughs> talk about was when, although she had an incredible career. Uh, again, uh, <laughs> when I was in school, I have told this story before. It, it was at the ninety nine cent theater, you know, on mm-hmm. its last I run, yeah, and I li- I went every. Because I knew it was only going to be a week. I went every single day. I became obsessed with that film. To this day, it's one of my favorite films. It is so weird and interesting and the intricate relationships of what happens behind the scenes. Did you have any, did you cross over at all with um, Vittorio Gossman? Oh, yeah, yeah. When we you got could that, have talked about Fellini. When we got that movie, we got a binder. There were 32 characters in the movie. And we got a binder, and it would outline. It would say, "This is this is a scene that would show." I'll just talk about my character: brotherly love between you and your sister, who's getting married. And it'll be shot in August, the second week in August. And you read all these binders, and there were suggestions of like that was that would yeah. be a scene. That that's all that they wrote in the scene. And then you had to figure out how you would show love to your sister. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be in as many scenes as possible, and we knew there was going to be a big scene in the men's room and a bigger scene in the ladies' room, mm-hmm. and I wanted to be in both of them. <laughs> and she was going to wear braces, and I grew up with braces, and I always had cake or falafel or something all in the braces yeah. in my teeth. And I knew, like, when I went to get my first Holy Communion or whatever it was that I had a toothbrush in my mouth, yeah, you know, before you have your school picture taken or whatever those things, you know, all that stuff when you're growing up. So I, I pitched it to Bob and I said, I want to be a brush boy. She has no pockets on the wedding dress. She needs a fucking uh, toothbrush. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, yeah, she needs a toothbrush. <laughs> yeah, you be the guy. And he okayed it all. And I have a whole scene in the men's bathroom. And then I run over to the ladies' bathroom. And she lets me in. And we played it like we were twins. And he loved it because he said, that's the only two people that love each other in the movie. (laughs) Everybody else is a conniver, even the man that she's marrying. Yeah, That's all fake. This is the only love connection in the movie. Because you idolize her. Uh And she relies on you. And when you get that kind of validation... Right. From somebody like Robert Altman and the writers that he works with. Then you'd go, you'd take your idea to the writers. They would help you form a scene. They would help you shape a scene. Unless you were audacious enough to figure the whole fucking thing out. Mm -hmm. Because when I figured that out, Amy then picked it up and had a scene where her, with herself looking in the mirror, and it actually turns out to be the first time you see her with braces, and she smiles in the, in the bathroom mirror. And then later, 
Mia jumped on the idea. And Mia comes in and throws water in the face, and you see she must hate her sister. <laughs> you know, it was just everybody would leapfrog off of everybody else's idea yeah. and make this kind oh, of theatrical film. presentation. And to see people working like that, mm. who come from different backgrounds, who come from ver like. Vittorio Gassman to yeah. uh, I, Nina Van Palant to right. Carol Burnett. There's a story with Carol. Um, we were sitting in one of the times where we were waiting in the church, endless times. They're now getting close up on the preacher or something mm -hmm. like that. And I was, we were doing it like I was a mama's boy. Uh, that she, she's always playing with my hair. We had to go in and get all our hair dyed to the color of her wig. She didn't have to go, but her wig was sent over. Me and Mia Farrow and Amy Stryker and a couple of the nephews uh -huh. were all sent in to have our hair dyed the same color as Carol Burnett's wig. <laughs> <laughs> so we were sitting in the church waiting at one point, and she goes, you were really good in a wedding, and that, that movie, I'm in, in Three Women. And I said, I'm in it two seconds. She said, no, but there were not very many men in that movie. <laughs> she said, I had a very... Very disturbing dream about that movie last night. And I said, yeah, okay. What was your dream? And she said, well, I, I felt like I was in the bottom of the swimming pool. And instead of painting those serpents in the bottom of the swimming pool, like Janice Rule did yeah. in Three Women, those big, grotesque Yes, the murals. movie is disturbing. Uh, Johnny, put up the picture, would you? <laughs> <laughs> he'll find it. Just pop he'll in. Fi he'll find <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. He will. Come on. Janice Rule, yeah, no. Three Women. <laughs> yeah, you're like, go for it. Um, she said, I'm in the pool, and I'm painting big erotic murals of Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Minnie Mouse. <laughs> wow. And I said, oh. She said, what do you think that means? And I said, maybe you're a little bit scared of a cartoonish performance. Because <laughs> <laughs> she was very nervous. This was yeah. her first movie Serious film. with a big Hollywood yeah. director. Because Bob had made Nashville. You didn't right. really let this guy down, let alone MASH and yeah. McCabe and Mrs. Mill. You know, yeah. this is Bob Altman. And she was... She really wanted to make the transition to mm -hmm. a serious actress, and she had some stuff to say, you know. Yeah, um, she was terrific in the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the film. All right, let's get to, but we've got to get to uh, um, to uh, Breaking Away. Oh, oh that. And, oh, that film. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> Which you told me when you're here, you, uh, you, and I you still have the bike. Yeah, I still got the bike. It was 40-year anniversary I know. last year. I was watching... Uh, Daniel Stern, who I've worked with. Oh, Dennis Danny, yeah, yeah, Quaid, yeah. who I've worked God with. God, we were young. It's incredible just yeah. to see you guys and all Jackie. up there. Yes, I've never met him. Oh, he's the but, best. But uh, incredible. Jackie uh, Earl Haley, Paul Dooley, who I've worked with. And um, it's just an incredible film. You know, and, and, and I'm Barbara just, Barry. Barbara Academy Barry. Academy Award winning she was, or nominated she was, at that she, point? I'm One sure. potato, two potato. It's a she lived in one of the buildings that I lived on Riverside oh, Drive. I always oh, remember it was a nice her. apartment. Yeah, she was a nice lady. Sure, she's still there. I, I wonder. I yeah. hope so. Um, she just did a play last year. Oh, good. All right, thank God. I keep in. Oh, look, there's Breaking Away, and uh, just an incredible movie. I, I think again, I grew up in a small town, and. Uh, you know, we had quarries, mm. and people jumped off the quarries. And even though the film takes place in Indiana, and, and my brother, like many people, I'm sure, who come up to you, became a cyclist oh, after yeah. seeing Breaking Away. Started shaving his legs <laughs> in the bathroom. You know, my spandex. Mother, my mother was like, what are you doing? You know, he was a racer after that. After From then, yeah, that point yeah, on, yeah. He, became a, he became a racer. Yeah. Um, but just an incredible, the camaraderie on the set was, you know, did you guys just, well, you said you had. I knew Dennis before. We had yeah. made that nine, uh, 93055 was the original name of that Jim Bridges movie. Oh, I see. They changed it to September 30th, 1955. Um, we, we got to be good friends then and um, remained friends after that. Um, Danny, I never met, but he goes down real easy. So funny. So funny and so easy. Yeah. And Jackie, I was gobsmacked. There were two actors that I knew, and uh, Paul I knew from working in a wedding. 
Yeah. Um, but Barbara Barry, I was just so thrilled that I was going to get to meet this actress who I had so much respect for. Right. And Jackie, who I knew from Day of the Locust. Right. When he was playing that mm -hmm. um, Shirley Temple yeah. person. Yeah, the John and, Schlesinger. Yes, film. and I yeah. thought he was so amazing in that movie. And then, you know, then of course, Bad News Bears. But what I really liked about him was that the that the Schlesinger movie. Mm -hmm. No, 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 it wasn't Schlesinger. It was um, Day of the Locust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought it was Schlesinger. I'm going with Schlesinger. Okay. I often say things wrong. But I can I'm, fact check here. Fact check. Good. John Schlesinger, Day of the Locust. Waiting on that, but anyway, we'll continue. <laughs> um, anyway, I was really impressed to meet them, and he was. He was like, "You know, that was me," and I said, "Of course." I looked it up in the credits, but he was great, and, and we're still that's in right. touch. And it is Schlesinger. Mm -hmm. It is Schlesinger. Oh, confirmed. Good. Yes, God. confirmed. Thank Give yourself some credit, guys. Come I on. get some what things great, wrong. She knows everything about. No, me. no, sure no I get some things. She right introduced the wrong. Oscars. Come on, she know. knows everything. Yep. She's Oscars on the side. I agree. The, uh, <laughs> I want to Oscar's side piece. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about oh, how, how oh. you're... I w <laughs> to say that. I'll, I'll take that. I'll take anything. <laughs> but I want to take uh, uh, how you're, you're working with your tech advisor uh, oh. kind of cha informed your acting in the movie because oh. you said you learned so much from the physicality of the breathing and the cycling and yeah. how you brought that into your acting. Yeah. I missed the, f there were two weeks of rehearsal and a week of shooting that I completely missed because I was on another movie with Richard Harris and Karen Black and Penelope Milford and I couldn't get off this movie. It was supposed to be over. Richard was having a lot of difficulty with the directors and the producers and Roy Bolting directed it and um, I couldn't get off the movie. My agent lied to the director and the director knew he was being lied to. He lied to the studio. Um, they kept saying, get the second choice. We can't wait any longer. What are you, who mm. is this guy that you're waiting for? What the, you know? Yeah. Because I was nobody from nowhere. And uh, he kept stalling them. And when I got out of the movie, I took the midnight flight to where we were shooting, to Bloomington, mm -hmm. and they put me right in hair and makeup and I shot a scene that day. Wow. And the character had dark hair, black hair, right. tan skin, a skin-tight band line shirt unbuttoned down to the navel almost with gold chains hanging around it, skin-tight pants, and big boots with pointed toes and the big heels. I look like, they were trying to make me look <laughs> like John Travolta from right. the beginning of Saturday Night Fever. And I did what they said because I was late and tired mm -hmm. <laughs> and scared. It was, I was the lead of this movie mm -hmm. and it was the first time and I was scared. And there was all this stuff to do that I d didn't quite know what I was going to do with the Italian accent. And I, they never auditioned me for that part mm -hmm. to see if I could do it or any of that stuff. But I'd been working on it while I was shooting this other movie. And I get down, and I, I kept saying, this isn't right. They shot a whole scene that day. The next morning, I go to the set. I called my agent up that night, and I'm looking at the, the Polaroids they give you. And I said, I can't do this movie. I look like, you know, mm. remember when Lillian, when um, 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 Lily Tomlin did her cab driver, that oh. guy cab driver that she played? She had... The, one of the many characters when she used to do yes. all those characters. Right. I looked like that guy. <laughs> I said to my agent, I said, I look like a drag king yes. in this movie. And these guys would have beat me up. None of these guys would have been friends with me. <laughs> this is so phony and so false. I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. Get me out. She said, you've never been in any movie. I'll be fired. We've signed the deal memo, everything. I said, I haven't signed the contract it was a nightmare. I get out of the car the next day, and I see Peter Yates, and I run to him. It's like that commercial way back then, in slow motion. You know, <laughs> and we grab each other, and he was very taciturn. But I grabbed him and hugged him and burst into tears. I'm an Italian. Yeah. And he goes, what? you know, then the awkward hug comes. <laughs> and he goes, what's the matter? And I say, I can't do it. I can't play this part. I'm not the guy. I'm going to ruin your movie. I know it means a lot to you. Please get somebody else. This is the first day after we shot that alternate character. Hmm. And he said... I know. 
go back to the hotel, and go to bed. <laughs> so I did. They closed down the movie that day. I thought, I'm out of here. Him and Steve came over, and I did fall asleep. Mm. Him and Steve Tessich mm -hmm. came to my place, to the little, you know, Motel 6, <laughs> no, 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 the Days yeah. Inn, yeah. you know, where I'm staying in. And he, they say, so what's the deal? I said, I don't want to pretend to be Italian to get this girl in bed. I, it's not, it's not him. He wants, he wants other things. He wants the family. He wants the Italian feel. He's not trying to get laid. Right. He's not trying to, you know, bully anybody. He wants, you know, he's listening to Mario Lanza records. You know, right. there's a different thing. He's not a cool guy. He's not, you know, a hitter, a player. It's none yeah. of that shit. And they said, well, wh how, what, well, I said, I want, I want to have, I want to look like one of those angels in the top of the uh, Sistine thing. That's the kind of Italian that I want to be. Mm -hmm. And I want to be pure and light, and I ha want to have light coming through the character. And they were like, oh, uh, they sent somebody to my apartment in California and got my clothes out of the closet. I didn't have that many. All the clothes that I'm in that aren't racing gear are my clothes. Um, and they gave me a, they set my hair and made it curly. Barbara Barry came down, saw it, and she had her hair. She said, yeah. oh, I'm going to clue into that. We're going to look like mother yeah. and son. And it, the whole thing changed. And Steve That's said, great. how are you going to convince the girl that you're not the Italian guy anymore? I said, with my acting. <laughs> I said, did you really think I was going to take off a costume at that point? Yeah. On the campus and say, I'm not the guy, I'm the other guy? Yeah. And so Robin Douglas, who deserves all the credit, mm -hmm. um, we improvised that scene in the gazebo where I tell her. Mm -hmm. It was written completely differently. It was all made up stuff. And where I'm saying, I was the president of the, of the mask in mime. You know, I'm saying all those things. <laughs> yeah. Saying, oh, no, I went to school here. I'm a guy. You know, I'm a yeah. little and, and she just plays it like because she doesn't want to believe it. And she goes, right. she's just in that scene. And they watch the rehearsal and it was totally improvised. Right down to when she, she leaves, comes back and slaps the shit out of me. Yeah. And she really did it hard on the rehearsal. And then leave. And they were like, their mouths were open, and they said, let's just leave this alone wow. and let's shoot this scene the way that it is. Mm -hmm. And he said, he, they, one guy said, uh, somebody said to her, you might not want to hit him as hard as he, and I said, no, you, no. <laughs> Whatever happens, how, she wants to kick me in the balls, it can happen. It's not, you know, don't, don't mess with anything. And they used to, they had to, like, take the red out in between the shots when they went in for the close-ups and right. stuff. Right. But we got that scene down, and that was, for Steve, that was the big linchpin of revealing, but not revealing it in a tawdry kind of way. And it, right. It just, there were so many things about that movie that all came together ser serendipitously. Right. And at the right time. And if it wasn't with that time, with those people, it wouldn't work. You were saying about the quarries. Yeah. The woman who Incredible. won an Oscar I never for production the... design, Patricia yeah. von Brandenstein, was our art director. And yeah. you'd say, what does the woman that designed Amadeus have to do with designing <laughs> Breaking Away? It was all there in Breaking Away. That quarry was completely full of trash, covered with graffiti. She wow. bought in steam cleaners and uh -huh. cleaned and made that quarry look so gorgeous. Wow. And that's what a production designer does. They move heaven and hell. They don't just move furniture around and draperies. Well, it looked idyllic. That's you know? what she made it look it like. It looked idyllic. It was supposed to be a part of America that was dying, but there was still something there. And thank God no cell phones. Thank God it was all before that whole onslaught when you could tell us a pure story in a pure manner. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and also the friendship between the, you know, the four guys is just it's and the just father incredible. Son, and the father son and the fact that he's being phased out like Yeah. But their relationship seems so real. There's humor in it. Uh, oh, the guys were so good. Dennis was so great and, and Danny. Yeah. And the way and I do I love the way it's shot. Um, you know, very realistically. And I think again you and Eddie Yes, yeah. you're. Uh, I think again. I mean, in in remembering it as you know, p 
people, like I said, my brother saw the movie, he wanted to be you, you know, pe because I think that it expressed, again, this sense that you don't have to be the, you know, macho Dennis oh. Quaid guy. You were, you, asking me, you were asking me about that with the training, um, to answer that question more specifically. When I got down there so late, that's why I did that whole late, told you the whole story about being late. When I got down there, this was the era where, you know, Ryan O'Neill's going to be in that movie with Barbara Streisand, so he becomes a boxer. Right. You know what I mean? He trains and he can really box and so and so can really fence and yeah. the other guy can really wrestle and all these people <laughs> go out and they, they you know, Sylvester Stallone is suddenly boxing people. Everybody's doing this stuff. Yeah. And you go, you know, I weigh 130 pounds. What the fuck? You know, I've been training to be an indoor actor my whole life. You know? <laughs> an indoor actor. So, and they're sending equipment over to the set on this movie I did with Richard Harris, and I, I couldn't get up on the thing. I couldn't do any of it, you know. So I get down there, and they give me this uh, bicycle champ, Gary Rybar. And... I can't do it. I try for a week to make myself into a bike champion, and I realize I have no respect. I think I'm going to make myself into a champion bike rider like this character in two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's like asking Gary to become a really interesting, at least, actor in two weeks. It right. doesn't happen. It just doesn't happen. So what we did is I made him do every scene in the movie that was the racing stuff. And I watched his face. Mm. I would be in a car and drive along the side and watch how he was. I would just study what his face did. We even met. He had this habit of putting his head down. It was mm. like he was davening, you know. Uh, um, and yeah. he would do that, and I would match my head to his so they could cut on the thing from a long shot to a close shot. So I realized that you have to use your acting to do that stuff, and all that other shit was just macho posturing. Mm. You know, it was bullshit. It would get in the way of anything else because you're trying to prove something instead of living the part of a character who already has these skills. Yeah. So all it has, they don't know that you're not going 65 miles an hour, but they know what your face looks like when you're going 65 miles an hour on the bike. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're scared, they know if you're, you know, whatever it is. So that's what I studied and right. that's what I recreated painstakingly was that. And the one trick that they said couldn't be done and they had all these wires hooked up and it was <laughs> elaborate and they couldn't make it work. And I, I not knowing anything about bikes, I said, after like a four hour delay, I said, let me just try it. And I picked that bike uh, book that falls out of her thing when she gets on the Vespa. Yeah. And I picked it up off the ground. And the bike expert said nobody can do that and stay on the bike and not and not put their foot leg down and yeah. get into it. And on the first take, I did. I said, I don't want just keep the camera going, no matter <laughs> what happens, because I was always going over there. And then they say cut, and then they tried to do a special effect with wires of right. having it jump up into my hand, and you could see the wires in the sunlight and. It was bad. Yeah. And I did that on one take. And wow. then they ended up using most of my stuff in the movie. There's some giant thighs in there a couple of... Calves. Calves. In there a couple of when times. When they cut to yeah, the peddling. Yeah, they look like... Yeah, it looks like Easter hams. <laughs> and, you know, it's my whole chest size is this calf, you know. Uh, you want a quarter pound cut thin. And uh, um, it was... And that was, you know, funny. The... There's a whole other story about Gary who's um, not with us anymore. Gary, as it turns out, years later, um, became Karen Rybar. Really? And it's a, it's a really interesting story wow, because okay. we had a 10-year reunion, and we were all being honored, uh -huh. driven into the uh, arena where the movie was taking place with yeah. our names on the side of the thing, and we were all there, and... And Gary's car was filled out because he was going to be there. He was Olympic class. Um, Carter had called off the Olympics that year because of the invasion of Poland, was it? And yeah, that, I and that wrecked Gary's dream. He was a local hero. When he was coming back, they, the rumors had started, and there was a bomb threat to the whole thing. They said, if he comes back, we're going to kill him. It was really, really ugly. So all the actors took a stance and said, if... And we had trouble with our pronouns. This is 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. Said if he, she, you know, comes back, and we didn't know what Gary's name was now, so we right. didn't know how to do it right. Um, and you don't let him, her in, <laughs> we're out of here. 
and we don't give a shit. And it was a big thing. It was it was a fundraiser for the university to build new buildings and everything. Yeah. Was a lot of money invested in the ten year re ten year anniversary of this movie. People magazine was there. Everything was there. Nobody he wasn't acknowledged. You know, mm -hmm. we never saw him. He just never showed up. So we're finally we have the last thing, the last thousands of people you shake hands and yeah. photograph with, and they're all drunk now because they're all in gowns and stuff at the gala afterwards. And finally, we're they say you can have a drink now. It's your free time. It's all right. We're the car's going back to the hotel in half an hour, kind of thing. And we're <laughs> like, okay, we're standing there, and I see this rather tall person across the room, and I said to everybody, hold on a second. And Gary and I spent a lot of time together. And I walked over to this person who was in heels now, who was very like that. <laughs> and I went over to this person and I said, you had your fucking nose done. Because <laughs> we always used to joke about our big schnozzes. Uh -huh. And like that was the best part of us because that thing could really match, yeah. you know what I mean? And I said, you had your fucking nose fixed. And she just started to laugh. <laughs> and, and I said, what are you drinking? Because she was too afraid to go to the bar to order a drink. Aww. So I went to the bar and I got a drink. And I said, come with me. We went over to the two chairs that we could find way in the corner. And I asked every question you're never allowed to ask somebody. Because I knew this guy. <laughs> right. I knew this person. This is a great, this sounds like a and movie And I said, wait, wait until you hear the end. And I said, you know, what do they do? Does it feel good when you have sex? I mean, what's the <laughs> deal? Do you come? Do you tell the guy? <laughs> Were you gay? And I didn't know it? No, I was never gay. I was, uh, the whole fucking thing. And every taboo question, I said, the titties, what's the deal? Does milk come out? Okay. You know, the whole thing. So we're Family talking. Family show. You know, oh, it is? No, I'm kidding. Um, it's a podcast. I I'm thought kidding. I'd go for it. Anyway, um, it's changing the what whole. What does pod stand for? No. Um, so uh, so he t she tells me everything there's to tell. She, I can see her shoulders go from this to this. But it was cute. Like, the dress is so tight. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like I, a little I'm contrast not, I'm, that's so tight it's I'm gapping it. at, at all the things. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the hair's color from a box, you know? Yeah. Because until that, this is 30 years ago. Right. Until that, I didn't know what it meant to be a trans uh, person. Mm -hmm. yeah, I really didn't understand it at all. Right. And whenever you saw anybody like that, it was more people that manifested it in a glamorous kind of Diana Ross's kind of way. You right. Know what I mean, I didn't know people were real, working, poor people that were trapped inside the wrong yeah. fucking body. You know, I, I just didn't under. I was too young. I didn't yeah. get it. Um, but then we talked. And we went back to everybody else. They couldn't believe it. It was Karen. We all danced like maniacs, fast <laughs> dancing and everything. No one knew. It was so joyous and so fantastic. And then they put on a slow song. <laughs> and I said, Karen. Oh, and we slow danced. I'm slow dancing with my double from Breaking Away at the 10th year. And a big special gala thing. Yeah. Where we were 20 minutes or two hours ago, we were photographed of People Magazine by everybody. And I whispered in Karen's ear, This is the picture for People Magazine <laughs> right here, right now. Yeah. And I think it was one of the be better nights of her life. She had a great, great time. What an incredible story. And I said, What did your father do? Your father was the biggest redneck in the world. He said, He bought me a little kiosk. You know those things where you're locked in and you go and you drop your. Um, Instamatic film off, and then you come back and they right. give you the prints. Yeah. And they were all, you know, um, consi not consignment. They bought, you know, the franchises. Right. And he bought her that because he knew she didn't have the right ID, ID to get a job anywhere hmm. and to protect her yeah. in those little booths so that no one, if they. Well, that's an amazing story. My goodness. Incredible. All right. Hard to, hard to transition. But uh, we're gonna go to the fun, a fun movie for uh, again part of my drive-in uh, appreciation. <laughs> Fade to Black, oh, wow. which yeah. I loved, uh, and a real Hollywood movie again about you know someone obsessed with oh, the that's movies. Why we're, and, that's why we're this today. This yes, time, Fade to Black. Then. And uh, yeah. did you have fun uh, making that movie? No, really, not at all. Yeah. You just it was such a fucking burden, and I loved it so much. I. 
I said no three or four times because it was flawed. The script was really flawed. Uh huh. Um, every single scene was beautifully conceived by Vernon Zimmerman. Mm -hmm. It had been rewritten so many times to satisfy so many people that it was just crap. Right. It was like something that had, a field that had been planted and over and harvested again and again and again. So it didn't even make any sense. Right. And now people are writing scripts on computers, so you don't even have to retype the whole thing and make it flow. You right. just insert the new scenes, you know, right. what I mean? and it doesn't really flow from the scene before. I liked it better when you had to write the whole thing out because yeah. then you... Anyway. But I like the concept that you have to keep you're in, you're playing all these different characters and we yeah. get to see the movies. Yeah, but it was crap before and <laughs> I said no and they gave they it worked in the drive. They finally they kept putting the movies the money up and up and up and up to the point where I thought my father would kill me if I turned this down. He'll <laughs> yeah. never offer me this again and when will you ever get to play a part like this guy? I can make this better. It was the kind of thing where we'd be shooting in a diner and they would rap, and they'd throw everything on the table in a box. And then the next day where you're shooting the exact same scene, uh -huh. everything on the table would be different. <laughs> and I would go to the prop truck and get all the stuff <laughs> that was on the table and put it back in. I decorated that whole la lair that he was in with the thousands of pictures cut yes. out on the wall. There were three movie posters from movies you never heard of, and I, it, decorating, I said, what's this? And they right. said... We couldn't get the rights to any other things, and we couldn't afford to use the things, the movie things. And that's all. We, I said, "Are pictures in magazines public domain?" And they said, "Yeah." So I had my, I had an assistant by that time. Yeah. My assistant go back to the house and get every one of the magazines uh -huh. from Comment, those things that uh, all the magazines. Yeah, premiere. The, yeah, the magazines era. used to be the thing, you know, yeah. before the internet and stuff. It was right. magazine orama, <laughs> and I had every magazine that had anything to do with film, yeah. and we sat a whole day and cut them out and made that room. So every scene, the pressure was on. Like the mummy character, yeah. it had a zip up the back. It looked like a toaster cover <laughs> that you put on the toaster. Even the, It zipped right up, and you're in it like the Marshmallow Man. And I wouldn't do the scene. And yeah. they called Erwin, your blonde's down, and he won't come out of his trailer. He won't do the thing, you know. And he comes over, and I said, Erwin, you promised me I wouldn't be. Look at this fucking thing. He said, <laughs> what is that you got on? I said, this is... This is it. This is what you got for me. <laughs> and an he said, that life. won't go. He stood there, and we tea-dyed in, in the Winnebago now. Yeah. Um, tea we tea-dyed 150 things of gauze. Mm -hmm. And he wrapped my whole fucking body, Erwin <laughs> Blondes, and put stuff in it. We uh -huh. put oatmeal and shit in it and yeah. wrapped it and dried it with the dryer and the put uh, Fuller's dirt on it yeah. and made that mummy costume scared enough to look, yeah. to kill somebody, <laughs> not to make somebody laugh. Right. He was in my trailer dying the thing for the vampire. He is such an on, hands-on, he said, I haven't felt this good being a producer in years. I'm always in an office. Now I'm dead. You know, he's in my trailer dying the ribbon that the medallion's going to be on the vampire. Because yeah. I had said, there shouldn't be any red in the movie except when the blood comes out of her neck. Right. In the whole shot, no red. And he said, yeah, that's it. And we, Vernon was very happy because I think he had been told to move fast, rewrite it. Right. We don't have the budget. I mean, there was supposed to be a scene with Linda Carriage doing Marilyn Monroe where she did Gentleman Prefers Blonde, the whole number. Right. And right before we were shooting it, they come and say, we're canceling it. We couldn't afford the money to pay for the thing. Yeah. And I said, so I'm never going to see this girl as Marilyn Monroe? <laughs> Eric Binford is never going to imagine this beautiful girl who happened to be a wonderful actress, I thought, yeah. Linda Carriage. I said, nothing? Nothing? That she's never going to appear as Marilyn Monroe? Are we crazy? Because I hadn't figured out the Prince and the girl Showgirl scene yet. Yeah. And they said, yeah. I said, happy birthday. That's a famous Marilyn Monroe song. You just change it to Mr. President at the end. Everybody knows Marilyn Monroe sang Happy Birthday, Mr. Right. President. Film Linda Carriage, because she's all made up in the costume, yeah. in the same thing with a just hang up right. a sheet, you know what I mean, and keep it close, <laughs> and put Vaseline. That's exactly what they did. 
<laughs> and then they found out they had to pay for happy birthday. <laughs> but the footage was so perfect. And Irwin was like, yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah, we'll do this. Because there were like line producers that were c- trying to keep it cheap. Yeah. But when Irwin got involved, it was like the Pope came down to right. serve mass with the people. You know what I mean? <laughs> Instead of the regular priest. Well, it's an interesting movie to talk about, you know, contrasting it to films like Joker and, you know, people that are obsessed mm-hmm. with entertainment and go off the deep and end. And fame and all of that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think if people are looking for that kind of a film... We, I think... I try. Plus, you get to, I, I don't know, the fun of it is that you, all of the different costumes, I think. The research was so fabulous, and I, I I must say, I it was like dressing up for me, being in that yeah, movie. Yeah, that's what because I... Because quality control felt like it was... It was the first picture that I had my name above the title, mm-hmm. and they paid me a lot, and I felt I had responsibility to it. Right. And it was the second time people were going to see me in a movie, and I thought... I got to make this good, and I know where all the problems are. But this right. role is incredible. I get to be Bella Lugosi. I yeah. get to be Lon Chaney. I get to be Richard Widmark. You know. Oh, I know Richard Widmark. Okay, I want to move on to playing opposite Elizabeth Taylor in The Little Foxes, which is one of my favorite films and one of my favorite plays. I love The Little Foxes. <laughs> and uh, did you enjoy? Being uh, in, in the play, who, which character did you play in The Little Foxes? I played Leo, the guy that oh, steals man. the bonds from the box. So for... you were the Dan Dur. If you've seen the yeah, movie, yeah, the yeah. Dan Durier. Yeah, I was the young one, the young so-called stupid one who yes. did all. It. Yeah, it was a great part. What a great Republican play. That is. <laughs> it's, a great, it's very GOP. Yes, it's, it's a perfect. great. She was a Trumpette. Yeah, <laughs> Regina was a Trumpette. <laughs> Elizabeth would have liked that. Um, one thing you'll like this, or maybe you'll like this. I had to be okayed by Lillian Hellman. I mean, and you went you went to her apartment for tea, Uh. and she was desperate that no one would know that she was blind. Mm -hmm. She had been fooling people for years, but you know, being an actor, you want to watch like every fucking thing. You know what I mean? I saw everything on the walls, everything on the you know. And I'm watching her, and she was very like she would pour the tea, but the finger would go like this, so she could feel the liquid. You know, the sugar were lumps, so yeah. she knew how many, how much sugar she was putting in her tea. It was all like that, and she couldn't see me, but I sat like right there. Yeah, you know? and um, I can't remember what we talked about, but it was really amazing, and I think I, I just pulled out every gentlemanly thing I could think of to do. Yeah. And I think I even flirted with her a little bit. (laughs) But I got the goddamn part. But I think the producers wanted me to because um, my agency didn't want me to do it because it was a long commitment. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was right after Breaking Away and Fade to Black and they wanted to get me in another big thing. And I just couldn't pass it up. It was Maureen yeah. Stapleton. It was Elizabeth Taylor. And it turned out that one of my very first acting teachers, Austin Pendleton, was directing it. Wow. I studied at HB Studio with Austin, and um, he was directing it. And then there was Anthony Zerbe and Joe Ponizecki and all these, and Novella Nelson, who became a lifelong friend of mine. Well, ours. what about people who came backstage just to visit Elizabeth oh, Taylor? Oh, f- no, it ha- crazy. Oh, it was absolutely crazy. Absolutely. The opening night, what was real. It wasn't opening night. It was one of the nights in Florida. Elizabeth had lost her front tooth on stage. Uh-huh. It had just fallen out on the gr- on the floor. <laughs> and I had been eating one of my bits on stage was biting into sugar cubes. It was kind of obnoxious, you know, and yeah. I'm chewing them. You know, you have to fill. Yeah. Know, the stars are talking a lot, and I'm just, <laughs> you know, the side on it. So, like, you know, so there was broken cubes on yeah. the oriental rug that was on the sh- so she turns we're in the middle of a scene that culminates with her running upstairs mm-hmm. and then she comes down five minutes later and it's just her and Horace and Horace has fallen out of his wheelchair right. and she won't give him the medicine which is just within reach yeah. the nit- nitroglycerin tablets and she kicks them further away from him and she goes I hope you die I hope you die soon and she flounces up the steps 
this is her big scene. It's the end of Act One, you know, yeah. setting up the whole, you know, the cat's out of the bag. She's yeah. really evil. It's really <laughs> happening, you know, kind of deal. Well, she turns, we have this whole scene with the brothers and me mm -hmm. and her. And she turns to me because we were kind of close. And she goes, like that. And I swear she looked like Alfred E. Newman made up like Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> and her, big, her front tooth was totally missing. Uh -huh. And she went like that. And then she ran up the stairs. For five minutes before that was happening, she was clutching at her bosoms. Her mouth was quiet, and she wouldn't say any of her lines. So we're like, Anthony Zerby and Joe mm. Panzeg are kind of like trying to feed each other her lines to keep the plot moving. Right. I'm crawling around on the floor because I'm the only one that knows what has right. happened to her. They don't know what happened. So now they've got her not saying her lines and me on the floor looking for the tooth. <laughs> they don't know what I'm doing. They don't know what she's doing. Eventually, she bursts into tears and runs up the stairs. Wow. Out of the thing. And there's only a little changing room at the top of the stairs. So you can't... <laughs> through the scene yeah so I'm looking and looking and looking I find the fucking tooth <laughs> but I'm on stage with my biggest scene in the play is happening when yeah. they're trying to convince me to steal the money and I'm yes. doing the right thing and all yeah. that shit and I'm trying to remember my lines and I'm looking at Novella Nelson and the thing and she plays the, the maid so I'm like <laughs> you'll come out you know I'll put it on this little ashtray or whatever right. this thing is here and you'll come out and clean the ashtray and you'll get the thing and the tooth will go upstairs and they'll take it back in the thing and I don't know. <laughs> you know, maybe it'll work and she'll stop crying and the end of the first act will go okay. <laughs> <laughs> so she comes down, so they get the tooth in her. They used, I don't know what kind of glue, like Elmer's glue. I heard a hair dryer upstairs going, she's sh 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 drying the yeah. thing. And she comes down and goes, I hope you'll die. I hope you'll die soon. And she runs out again. <laughs> And at the curtain call that night, I got black electric tape and I passed it out to all oh, of that's the funny. cast. Uh -huh. And the curtain call was Elizabeth would go like that and everyone would turn and look at Elizabeth on that side of her. Yeah. And then she would turn and look at the left side and everybody would turn and look at her. And then when we were all locked in eyes, we would all bow together. Well, when they turned to her, they smiled at her and they all had electric, <laughs> uh, black electric tape on their tooth. Yeah. Including Maureen Stapleton. And they smiled at her and she went, ah! and then she looked at us and we all had it on our side. And then she just broke down laughing and we all bowed. The audience didn't know why she was flipping out like that because we all, we smiled and then closed our mouth. Right, right. So that no one knew. <laughs> yeah. And we wouldn't get in trouble with the stage manager for doing the prank on stage. But That's funny. We spent about a year together. What a great story. Okay, let's end with talking about uh, Django Unchained. What? Which is, yeah, yeah, what? Who? <laughs> <laughs> Very much in the news with uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm so thrilled that he has a director's nomination for this movie because his hand as a director yeah. is so all over this movie. Mm -hmm. Usually... With him, the first thing that gets my soul is the writing. Mm -hmm. Right. There was this writing here, but there was other stuff that wasn't written mm -hmm. that was his hand at telling his dreams. Right. You know what I'm saying? That His past and his feeling about actors, his composite feeling about working with actors, his composite feeling about the 70s, the whole yeah. thing. And to see the kind of direction that he gives in that movie, just f alone for Margot Robbie sitting in the theater mm -hmm. as Sharon Tate watching herself going, oh my God, I'm good. People are laughing at my bits. Yeah. And she's watching it alone. That he not only thought of that as a writer, there's no dialogue in the scene. It's right. all directing. And that's, to me, I'm, and the scene with um, Leo and the little girl. And yeah. Brad, the quiet, Brad feeding the dog. I mean, there were so many things that were just director things and actor things that were so detailed and intimate that that's, that's who I, you know, mm -hmm. it's hard. It's real Sophie's Choice. For me, that's who I, you know, well, that's who I want to see walking away. I want to see Quentin with the Best Director Oscar. I, I just do. Um, call me bad. 
No, not not at all. And the uh, just call me. And the, <laughs> you know the feeling of camaraderie uh, on on the set is it like one? I mean, I I visited the sets of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood just to watch. It's him very work. stimulating. With very him. inclusive. To he be knows, in the room with him yeah. is very stimulating. That scene in the in the in the dining room. I think it took us two weeks to do that. Isn't that and great? every day you know God. you're going to be in there with him, and he talks all the time, and the stuff that he knows. And for yeah. me, he's one of the kindest directors I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, from the tone of some of his films, you would think that kind might be further down on the list. Mm -hmm. But that was not my experience at all. At all. And... Um, He's just so present and so alive, and um, I just root so much for him. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I, 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 you know, I can't say that we're intimate friends, but um, I feel proud of Quentin for some reason. I don't know why. I feel like he's part of my Hollywood. Very much so. I, you know, I, of my time. Yeah. Um, although he's not. I mean, I'm older. My time was probably more in the... 80s and 90s as far as my time in cinema is concerned but I'm just so proud of him for the movies he made and the life that he's made for himself and the things that he has written because he's always right on the line mm -hmm. he's always right on the edge mm -hmm. and that's where the tr truth can be and that's where real feelings that you can feel nowadays because we're so inert of feelings, we just don't even notice our feelings half the time, we'll, or we avoid things that will give us feelings. Right. You know, we text, we don't want to hear the voice, we don't want to hear the tone. You know, and he, he's not about that. And the first thing you realize is that the fucking phones are ripped out of your hands. I mean, not literally. Right. But he you doesn't can't bring allow the fucking poison into the set. He won't let it in there. Yeah, he doesn't and allow he, at phones. first he goes, I don't want anybody to have it because it's a period piece and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Well, he did it on, he does it on everything. It's right. because he just doesn't want that stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things he liked about me is when I got off of the plane, when the you know stewardesses come and say thank you for the little plane ride down to, yeah. to New Orleans, um, she goes uh, thank you very much you know at the door like you know that Saturday Night Live that thing yeah. thank you for flying it and I, I would go well thank you and I thought she doesn't know me nobody knows me in New Orleans I'm just gonna start right now I said thank you and I checked into the hotel with the accent and I just refined it and refined it and never spoke not in the accent. Mm -hmm. And that can feel kind of phony sometimes, right. <laughs> needless to say. But, you know, then I'm on the set, and I'm just talking it the whole time, and people are... And I thought, okay, I'm, I'm sort of a boss here. I'm like one of the bosses here, so fuck them if they don't like me. Then <laughs> Leo comes in, and you're going to meet Leo for the first time. You know? mm -hmm. And I had brought this book about the year that we were shooting, and it had all the slang what was hot in the nation at the time, what everybody was talking about, mm -hmm. what people were eating, all this stuff, how you would curse and swear in right. that time that we were shooting the movie. And he said, so I hear you have this book. <laughs> and I said, why, yes, I do. <laughs> and he went, where did you get it? I said, I found it online and I ordered it. <laughs> In fact, I have two copies. I gave one to Mr. Tarantino. <laughs> and then he goes, you did? <laughs> and I said, he said, I'd very much like to borrow a copy of that book. And he started talking with the Southern, and then from that point on, all we ever talked was with the Southern accent. And at one point towards the end of the movie, he said to me, he said, thank you. And I said, what? He said, he said, you've just talked with the accent from the moment you came on the set. He said, thank you for setting that fucking tone. Right. Thank you very much. You made it easy for everybody else to get over that hump and start talking like a fool. You know right, what right. I mean? Like, yeah. And saying, well, I went too far on that one. And, right. Uh, and this isn't to say that Leo didn't have a dialect coach there, too. But the balls it takes to do it all the time, you know. Is well, that's the thing is every everything you have to do on screen that you know from the minute you get there in the morning and you 
getting made up and mm. all that. But did you know he never takes excess sound? Like, there were scenes at the table where I would laugh and I would go, because it was a group scene and right. they would put my laughter in later. I didn't want right. to ruin the, somebody yeah. else's take because sometimes they'd have two cameras going. And yes. You know what I mean? And you wouldn't be in that shot, but you'd be in the master shot. And if you laughed over it, it would be, you know, it would ruin the track. None of that happened until he finally said, Are you not laughing? I said, Yeah. He said, You laugh. You sneeze. You laugh. You clear your throat. Yeah. And I went, Oh, and he said, and don't worry who's on camera when it happens. And then I found out from Mark Ulano, who's his sound man every mm. time, um, there's no sweetening. There's no ADR in a Tarantino movie. Mm -hmm. There's no horse claps. Wow. Right. There's no door opening. If it, that's why everything works on a Tarantino set. Everything, he only takes the sound when it happens. When there's... For, when you're shot 14 times, there are 14 explosions on your body. That is the sound that's picked up. Mm -hmm. The scene with uh, uh, Margaret Qualley and Brad Pitt in the car on the freeway when she when he's taking her out to the school right. and ranch for the first time. Yeah, live sound with the freeway honking and the old Margulano in the back seat getting live sound because there's no dubbing yeah. in a Tarantino movie. It has to happen on the set or it's not in there. And there's a couple of times where I'm going like that in the movie and nothing comes out. And I'm, I, I thought, oh, shit, I wish I knew this before <laughs> I went in. You know, because I was just trying to be professional, you know, and right. fuck up somebody else's take. But he's amazing that way. It gets to feel like theater uh -huh. after a while. Well, with so many people in, the, in a shot, too. And the reality. Yeah. The reality that there's no phone. No, you know, nobody's checking to see, you know, if the kids got to preschool or, mm -hmm. you know, the, the pipe that exploded in, the, in right. the basement. You know, there's nothing. There's only you and the story and him mm -hmm. narrating the shots for you. Yeah. Narrating. Or, like, there was an elaborate lighting scheme and it was all on one side of the table and then they were coming in to get my coverage. And you know you're in a scene with five Academy Award winners. You know you're the, you know you're the pickle dish. You know <laughs> there's the ham and the turkey and the pheasant, and then you're the pickle dish you know, <laughs> on the side. There's the mashed potatoes and the stuffing too. But you're the pickle dish for sure. But I know what I was, you know, and I was happy to be that color, in the movie. But they came around to do my coverage, and I thought, okay, um, the pickle dish will get his. But and then. They're saying, well, do we move the the netting from this side, from Christoph's side and Jamie's side over to Dennis's side? To, not to Dennis's side, to Mr. Mogi's side? Because <laughs> yeah. everybody was calling each other by the characters yeah. name only. So, and they'd say, and Quentin said, let me tell you something about Mr. Mogi. Dennis Christopher was photographed by Frederico Fellini. Do you think he skimped on anything? <laughs> Do you think that wow. he didn't want to change it? He said, so I think, yeah, we're going to put the netting on the other side. I love it. That's he such said, a sweet thing to do. And I mean, also, but he'd also, whenever anybody came up to do something, mm -hmm. if he thought, he wanted everybody to know who everybody was. Yes. That's kind a, of thing. Or it's is. Important. And... I didn't audition for this man. This script was on my doorstep. And wow. I called my agent. I said, what is this? And they said, oh, yeah, we gave your address. And I said, you're not supposed to give anything but the P.O. box. They said, no, just open the envelope. <laughs> <laughs> and it sprawled with a magic marker. It was Django Unchained by Quentin Tarantino. And, and that was it. I had the part. I went, no, I went in to see him. And we talked for nonstop for hours and I had done all the research on my character he said there's like there, oh and the note was pick any part that you want <laughs> so I of course picked the part that had the most yeah. tough and I was hooked up with Leo and I was clean yeah. <laughs> that was another big concern for me <laughs> the clean part <laughs> um, I, could, I could do clean you know so um, but of course it was the part that you would pick was the Mr. Mo yeah. So and I would pick, you know, and what he had in mind. Yeah. Um, and he just, I, I'd done the research on who, Mr. Mugliss. Everybody that has a name in his movies, there's a history behind that name. That right. Has nothing to do with the movie. 
that he's shooting. And that was a great director who had discovered Ava Gardner. He was a Russian director named Mogi. Uh-huh. Um, so there was oh, a whole fantastic. history. Of, and I was able to tell him the history of the guy, and I think that's another thing that helped me. So many layers. And well. he'd seen everything I'd been in. Uh, I, I challenged him, and I said, you saw Dead Women in Lingerie? And he said, why wouldn't I see a movie called <laughs> Dead Women in Lingerie? He said, I've had to go to your movies the first week they come out because sometimes they don't last in the theater that long. <laughs> I'm thinking, is that a compliment? Or is it <laughs> what? I'll take it. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, but I said, why? He said, he said, because I like your work. He said, you're always good, even though sometimes the pictures aren't. Yeah. He said, and I wanted to work with you. So. Wow, that's an amazing compliment. Well, Dennis, thank you so much for being here. My goodness, come back anytime. Uh, what a throw! What are you going to be? Are you going to be watching the Oscars? Oh yeah, for sure. we'll be rooting for. for sure. We'll see. I don't know anything, but. I, I just, it's, it's, the, you hit it, Jeff, with the Super Bowl. Oh, I know. It's just it. It's the day. It's yeah. the day. It's and, close. you know, it doesn't, you know, you, I was listening to your segment before, and you were, it was like the government was meeting on this, like, what was right and what was wrong. I'm thinking, this is an award <laughs> thing. I know. It's, it's there fun. are movies out there that we didn't even see that are probably better than anything that we've seen. I saw everything. Our, yeah. Well, you know what? Just this what, year. you got connections. They used to send us a packet right? With all the foreign picture nominees, yes. all the short subjects, all the animated, <laughs> all the stuff. Now you have to watch it online. That's true. Who progress. Fucking made the, that's not progress. You don't watch movies on computers. I know. You don't listen to soundtracks on computers. Amen. You put it on the stereo. <laughs> you listen, you turn it up all the way. I know. You listen to the score as it fills the house. You're listening to it on speakers from a computer? Right. What are they doing? I love the Academy when it was a mom and pop kind of thing. Yes. Did you remember that? You used to go down there. I knew all the names of all the people there. It is such a corp. Oh, I'm going to get in such I trouble. Know, well, before we get ourselves in trouble, we got to get out of here. <laughs> I <your> love these. <laughs> you know, I watch every movie and I work every show. year on those ballots. That's good. And it's hard work. Yes. It is hard work. And I'm sure a lot of you guys will be watching the Oscars, oh, too. God. Watching the Oscars. Uh, right. Please yes. watch the Oscars. Thank you so much for <laughs> listening in. It's been eventful, as we always end the show, as we say. <laughs> everyone's life is a movie with a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's the end of our movie for today. Thank you so much, Dennis Christopher. Thank you. Hope you check out all of the movies that we recommended on the uh, on the show today. And uh, let me know what you think. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. Everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful cinematic day, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the film scene with Ileana Douglas, airing exclusively on the Popcorn Talk Network. We bring you this show for free because we're just as passionate and borderline obsessed with film as you are. And it would mean a lot if you would please subscribe to our podcast and give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. It takes five minutes to review the show, but it helps other film junkies find the show and continue to spread a love of classic and contemporary film. For guest inquiries or live bookings, you can email me, Jeff Graham, at guests at afterbuzztv.com. That's G. G-U-E-S-T-S at A-F-T-E-R-B-U-Z-Z dot com. For more incredible film content, check us out online at The Popcorn Talk, and we'll see you after the credits.